Hey guys, Felipe here. Happy Monday. Hope everyone's doing awesome. Having a great uh, Labor Day weekend and Labor Day, getting some uh, beach in and just hanging out with the family. So uh, in this video, basically, I'm going to change it up a little bit. Uh, and I want to kind of uh, go into algorithms. Um, I find this stuff fascinating. Uh, and it, I think that everyone should kind of have a basic knowledge of what they actually are, considering there's a um, a term out there that I hear every now and then, code is law. And in a way, it's kind of true because everything uh, basically uh, in today's society or in today's technologically advanced world <clears throat> utilizes algorithms for everything, literally everything. So um, it's something that definitely should be at the very least understood somewhat. So I'm going to go into it and kind of, um, so my journey with this stuff kind of started uh, because I love finances and um, finances is so large. It's a world in its own, right? Um, but algorithms have been used for trading or for uh, financial decisions since really like the 1980s. So these things have been around for quite a while. It's not new, but of course it advances with advances in technologies and um, so forth and new creations that, that occur. So algorithms, what exactly is an algorithm? Basically it's in, it's in mathematic and in computer science. An algorithm is a finite sequence sequence of rigorous instructions typically used to solve a class of specific problems or to perform a computation. Algorithms are used as specifications for performing calculations and data processing. Basically, um, my view of algorithms in, in reality, most of them are used to I, either sort data that is receiving um, or to, uh, to traverse through that data and um, be able to acquire or have access to that data. Um, data can be, uh, for the most part, in all, uh, depending on what kind of language, programming language is used, data is typically, from my experience, um, that is shared between most or all languages are um, integers, which are just numbers, strings, which are basically um, anything within quotation marks, um, booleans, which is basically a true or false uh, condition. Um, there's many types of integers, of course, um, and that is basically shared, uh, these kind of types uh, that I just mentioned from what I've noticed are shared within basically all uh, programming languages for the most part. So algorithms basically either sort this in incoming data or input a data and input some sort of, um, output some sort of, uh, uh, outputs that data depending on what the algorithm is looking for or whether it's organizing it or, or something along those lines. Um, so <clears throat> what really got me uh, interested in this stuff is algorithm trading, right? Uh, which basically the process uh, of running a quantitative investment strategy can be broken down into following steps. So this is basically a strategy. Um, there many strategies can be created depending on what you want to use um, the algorithms for, right? In terms of trading in the stock market and um, so forth. So one, like I said, is basically data collection, um, develop a hypothesis for a strategy. So the trader or the uh, programmer slash trader creates a strategy. I mean, it's up to the imagination what kind of strategy you want to create, but I'm just going to go over a couple that I've um, I've learned to use this stuff for. 
Um, and in this case, quantitative investment, right? Investing. Uh, we're basically uh, back testing the strategy, meaning formulating your strategy and then seeing how it performs historically over time. There's two ways to do that. You can take the strategy back as far in time as you can and uh, uh, and across as many markets as you can. So to provide a quick example, let's say you have a hypothesis that a large firm, that large firms, blue chips, blue chip stocks basically would outperform. Um, you probably want to test that here in the United States and go as far back in time as you can. And then you also want to test uh, the performance of the largest firms in Canada, Europe, Japan, and China, India, and all the international markets. And if that strategy performs well in all of those markets, then you can be sure that you probably have a good strategy. Of course, even with all historical data that you acquire, nothing truly predicts the future, right? No one has a crystal ball. Algorithms are no different, right? They're basically as clever as the, the programmer writes them to be. Um, so number four, basically implement strategy in production. So you can collect the data from the hypothesis. You back test, tested uh, the strategy. And now you are going to start actually trading that strategy with real money and see if it does, uh, how it does with real money. Um, so it's basically just gathering uh, historical data of the performance of certain stocks, in this case, blue chips from different markets, um, such as Canada, Europe, Japan, China, US, and see, uh, analyze the performance of that period of time to see whether that's a good strategy or not. A lot of terms that basically uh, are common, not only in programming, but definitely with algorithms, uh, API, uh, application programming interface, which uh, I just, to me, they're just functions, uh, functions which are basically a block of code that you input something into it and you expect it to give you a certain output out, depending on what kind of, um, what's within the block of the function, right? So uh, is, uh, APIs are basically is a way for two or more computer program functions, like I said to me, they're functions to communicate with each other. It is a type of software interface ordering, offering a service to other pieces of software. Each custodian is used for trades, uh, which uh, custodians can be um, brokers, which will have different APIs. It's basically, you can use their APIs for data. Uh, for example, market capitalization of certain stock, um, get the data of a stock price, uh, outstanding shares for that stock. Um, and you can get APIs from you, Yahoo Finance um, and many other uh, websites that basically have all this information all this data, right, on these uh, stocks and companies and so forth. So ways to interact with APIs, basically post, uh, add, add data to the database exposed by an API, which this is create only, put, adds and overwrites data in, in the database exposed by the API, delete, delete data from the API's uh, database. Uh, multiple uh, databases are just containers where information is stored, um, kind of like a Excel file looking uh, template table thing. Uh, multiples, this is more of a finance term. This is not a computer science term. This is a, a finance term uh, are calculated by dividing a company's stock price uh, by some measurements of the company's worth, like earnings or assets. Um, so the basically it's good to understand the finances and computer science uh, and algorithms and coding and so forth to be able to combine them both and do really interesting things with them. Uh, so now basically going into some of the strategies I've learned, um, doing this stuff, uh, the, the equal weight S&P, uh, basically all the stocks in the S&P 500 equally uh, distributed. Uh, S&P index fund where each company has the same weighting and the market capitalization weighted. 
uh, basically generates an Excel file uh, where based on market capitalization, a set amount of shares would be purchased equally using a certain amount of funds in a portfolio. The Excel file is used to used for API communication to execute uh, trades using a written algorithm. Algorithm gathers the data, uh, based on the data uh, that it receives, it generates an Excel file. It sends the Excel file to the custodian. Custodian then executes the trade in lightning fast speed. That is the benefit of algorithms um, in terms of using them um, for investments or trading and so forth. They're very, very fast. Uh, quantitative momentum, uh, basically momentum investing trends using charge technical analysis and so forth, uh, kind of like how occasionally I show charts uh, with uh, historical price trends and so forth. Momentum investing, that's basically what it is, using momentum of a stock that is currently going up for going long or has been going down and in a trend for shorting. Uh, so basically, the strategy would suggest investing in Apple because of its higher uh, recent price returns. This is hypothetical, of course. Uh, so let's say Apple's uh, recent um, price returns have been consistently going up and up and up. Basically, Apple would be a momentum trade because the uh, the charts would show a trend upwards uh, for Apple, right? For Apple stock. Momentum investing basically means investing in assets, assets that have increased in price the most. Pretty simple. Uh, quantitative value. Value investing means uh, investing in stocks that are trading below their pre uh, perceived intrinsic value. You can, uh, you can say unpopular stocks. They're not very popular in the market. Uh, they have low price to earning ratios, but yet they are fundamentally uh, healthy, right? The, the, the company's uh, financially strong. They have a great balance sheet. Uh, their numbers look great. However, they're unpopular uh, and um, they're selling be below fair value, right? They're selling at a good value. This is basically value stocks. Um, so creating an algorithm, uh, for value investing strategies rely on relies on a concept called multiples, which is a term I recently went into, right? Uh, example of common multiples used, price to earnings, which is basically dividing a company's stock price by its earnings per share. Price to book value, uh, dividing a company's stock price, uh, a company stock price by book value per share and uh, price to free uh, cash flow, which is basically... Dividing a company's stock price by its free cash flow per share. These are some of the um, formulas you basically are multiples you use for quantitative value um, uh, in investing while using algorithms, right? Uh, I kind of went into how Excel files are generating, and then I'll, I'll make a future video on this stuff because it can get a little complicated and it might take a while to put this together. So basically, uh, for the most part, it, it, the strategies that I've been using or have learned generate Excel files, which are then uh, basically traders expect the algorithm to output. Output means the algorithm spits out uh, a generated Excel, Excel document and sends it um, to basically the custodian to execute trades. Uh, the contents of the Excel document has the name of the stock, so the company to uh, be purchased and the numbers of shares to be purchased and the numbers of uh, and uh, the number of shares to be purchased of each one of those companies that the trader needs to purchase. Uh, basically, algorithm trading means using computers to make investment decisions at lightning lightning speed fast, right? That is the the benefit to them. All right, so now I'm kind of I want to shift over a little a little bit to kind of uh, enter this world with a simpler understanding of what algorithms are. Initially, that's what really really uh, got my attention and interest in learning this stuff and why I find it so uh, cool and and fascinating. 
And I think it makes sense to have a basic understanding of this stuff, considering the world is literally run by algorithms all the time. You have no clue. Um, so, and people sometimes think they're godlike things. They're not. They're just cleverly written uh, uh, code, right? It's, it's code that is cleverly written to look out for certain uh, conditions and execute certain uh, uh, code and so forth. Um, it's, it's not is not a godlike thing. Like uh, I tend to hear sometimes in conversations. So uh, I'm a go into bubble sort, which is basically a uh, easier algorithm to understand. Um, and it has a big O of N uh, squared, which is quadratic time. A big O is basically a chart that that is used to determine um, the efficiency of certain algorithms and how much time it would take for them to complete certain um, calculations and so forth. So that is what big O is used, basically a, me a measurement of how long it would take the algorithm uh, to complete a certain um, task. So bubble sort basically matches the human mental model of sorting pretty well. So it, it's an algorithm that just, it's easier to understand because it, it it follows the human mental model. Uh, the algorithm is pretty simple. Basically it compares two items in an array that are next to each other. An array is basically a data structure uh, where data is allocated within it and can be accessed uh, or compared and so forth, right? Um, so if they are out of order, in the case of bubble sort, that is the larger one comes first in the array, swap them. So of course, to sort something, and in this case, numbers, you ideally want the lower numbers to be at the beginning, larger numbers to be at the end. So in this data structure, which is basically um, an array that has elements inside, bubble sort then sorts things from least to largest. Uh, so of course, larger ones come, uh, if, if the larger ones comes first in the array, in the array swap them for the uh, uh, lesser ones, uh, then move forward one index. Uh, index is basically the location of the elements inside of the array. And um, compare again, swap if needed and continue to the next item in the array. Once you've reached the end of the array, if you swap anything in the previous run through, the array could still be out of order. So we have to pass through it again. Once we run through the whole array with no swaps, the array is sorted. And then I'll show some pictures and stuff and I'll actually do this and it might make more sense. Um, so basically this is what bubble sort does. Uh, you can, this picture is pretty cool because it kind of, paints a picture of what the algorithm actually does. Basically, the smaller numbers are sorted towards the head of the array and the larger numbers are sorted towards the tail of the array. Head of the array is the beginning, tail of the array is the end of the array, right? Towards the end of the array. Um, so you can see this is what bubble sort does. It sorts everything um, from uh, lesser to greater, right? Uh, less Lesser numbers here or smaller numbers down here, bigger numbers towards the end of the array. I kind of, I like this because it really shows what bubble sort does. Uh, play it again one last time. It just basically all looks like little bubbles and then sorts it in order. So here, uh, basically this is an example of what bubble sort is, right? Um, at the very, top we have a array which is two square brackets right and with elements inside of it each element is an integer which is a fancy computer word for a number a number type um one five four two three you can see that they're not in order right uh after one should come two but in this case five is there so basically this is what the algorithm does, right? It, it asks in, in pseudocode, basically, are one and five out of order? No, because one is less than five, right? Um, are five and four out of order? Yes, because five is greater than four, so it swaps. Then it continues, 
Are five and two out of order? Yes, because five is greater than two. So it swaps. So you can see here kind of um, the swapping in progress uh, in the following arrays that are uh, then swapped, right? Are five and three out of order? Yes, because five is greater than three, right? So at the end of the array, if anything was swapped and the answer to that is yes, loop again through the code, right? At where the current um, array is organized. Are one and four out of order? No, because one is less than four. Are four and two out of order? Yes, because four is greater than two. So swap those two numbers. Are four and three out of order? Yes, because four is greater than three. So swap. And then finally, we end up with an organized array, which has the elements one, two, three, four, five inside of it. Um, the index is basically the uh, location of the num the elements uh, in in uh, programming. Uh, you always start counting from zero. So the number one in the array at the very bottom is an index zero, the number two is an index one, the number three is an index two, the number four is an index three, and then the number five is an index four. So this array basically has a total of four indexes. Uh, so here, basically, the uh, algorithm then asks again, are four and five out of order? No. So basically, end of the array. Did we swap anything? Yes, it has to loop again because something was swapped. That is a condition that the algorithm is looking for. And then it just asks, uh, the, it compares again. Are one and two out of order? No, because one is less than two. Are two and three out of order? No, because two is less than three. And so, and so forth. At the end of the raid, did anything swap? No, in this case, nothing swaps. So the algorithm outputs the uh, sorted array. Uh, so eventually, basically, your first run through, you will find the biggest number and we'll continue swapping with it until it reaches the last element in the array, like we did uh, with uh, five in our example. This is why it's called bubble sort, the biggest elements uh, bubbles to the last spot, as I showed in the, the little animated uh, image. Uh, think about this for a second. That means that at the end of the iteration, iteration is basically uh, going over and over in circles in a loop. That is what iteration means. We're guaranteeing that the biggest elements at the last spot. At the end of our first iteration above, five is the last element in the array. That means the last element in the array is definitely, it's correct, it's, it's in its correct spot. Uh, that part of the array is sorted. So on our second run through of the array, we technically don't need to ask our four and five in order. No, because we, uh, we know ahead of time that five is to be, bigger no matter what, right? So we can check one less element each iteration because we know uh, that at the end of the each iteration, we have one more guaranteed element to be in its, uh, be in its correct uh, place. At the end of the second iteration, we have four in its correct place, then three, then one, etc. cetera. So um, let me swap here and let's uh, see what, bubble sort actually looks like. So I'm just gonna change to terminal um, and I'm just gonna make a quick folder. So I'm gonna change directory to the desktop and then I'm going to make a directory called bubble sorts. And then I'm gonna change directory again to bubble sorts, um, which I can't spell. And I'm going to create a file in there called bubble sort.js. And then I'm going to open that with VS Code. So let me just swip, switch over here to VS Code. And here we have VS Code. Let me just close this, close this, open a terminal in here with control back tick. And I'm going to NPM init 
npm init. Just skip all this stuff. And then it created a package.json, right? So here I'm just going to add a, uh, a start script. I'm going to add a start script. Uh, and no, it's going to be node uh, bubble sorts.js. Okay. Save this and let's go over here. So here's where I'm going to basically write the bubble sort um, algorithm, which is fairly simple. It's going to be a function um, called bubble sort. And it's going to take in a numbers array, right? Uh, through the parameter here. So we're going to pass in a numbers array, the little box, little square brackets with the elements of numbers inside of it. Um, I'm going to create a variable called swap equals false. False is a Boolean type. True and false are Boolean types. And this is considered a sentinel variable. All right. And then basically, I can't spell sentinel. Um, sentinel. I'm going to spell sentinel. Uh, whatever. So I'm going to use a dual, a do while loop for this stuff. Uh, basically, while a certain condition is true, do this uh, run this block of code that is basically what a dual a dual while loop does so here swap is going to equal false uh we're going to use a for loop where we're going to let i equals zero as long as i is uh less than nums which is the array we're passing that length which is the total length of what's inside of that array, total number of elements inside of the array. And as long as that is true, we're going to increment I. Okay. Um, now, if, so an if condition nums, which is the array, the index of that array, is greater than nums or sorry less than greater so on the top is a for loop right let i equal zero this thing's in a way if i is less is greater than nums that length so if the current index is greater than the um uh the total uh if i is uh I just confused myself for there for a second. So repeat. So this is a for loop. Let i equals zero. So as long as i becomes a variable is equal zero, as long as i is uh, less than nums dot length, the total length of the array increments i. Here we have an if statement uh, where the current index of nums. If it's greater than nums index plus one, which would be the next number in the square bracket in the array, if it's greater, and I misspelled it here, so if nums, I don't usually have the text this big, but easier to see in a video, right? Okay, run this code. So if this is true, run, run this block of code. I'm going to create a constant variable called temp. Temp is just short for temporary. And here it's going to equal um, uh, the current index, right? Uh, so basically here, this equals this. So this is stored in here. That's basically what that is. Um, nums i, so the current index of nums of the array we pass in equals num z i plus one, which would be the next elements inside of that array. 
So now nubs i plus or I mean equals uh, the next elements in the array. And I'll go over this stuff um, once I write it to make more sense of it. Uh, nums i plus one equals temp. So we're, we're, we're reassigning this to, to have the value or of um, the temporary of, variable and then swap equals true because we swapped a uh we swapped uh numbers inside of the of the array right uh and of course we need a while so while swapped so while anything within the ad array is swapped that is true, so it reruns the block of code inside of the do. That's why it's called a do while loop. Um, and then I'm just going to console.log, which basically prints, prints uh, the, the array that I'm passing in. And then I'm going to just return the numbers, the nums array uh, towards the end. Great. Okay. And lastly, down here quickly, I'm just going to call the function bubble sorts. And I'm going to pass in that, um, that numbers array, right? So let's see, uh, 10, eight, five, four, three, one, right? So it's, as you can see the, the basically uh, what we're passing into the function through the function call, which is this line right here, bubble sort, what's inside of the parentheses is what's being passed into the function above. And you can see this is not in order, right? It should be opposite, right? One, one should be on the left and so forth. Um, but we're doing this on purpose to see how the algorithm works, right? So function bubble sort, this array here, this data structure here gets passed in here. And um, with the algorithm basically sorts it, right? So it all happens in here, right? So swap initially equals false. Um, and the moment it equals true, true, it basically triggers the while loop to run again. So this uh, for loop is basically just to run through the elements in the array through the index, right? So as uh, i equals zero, as long as i is um, less than nums dot length, increments i, right? And now we're using i as the uh, index, right? Of that array that we're passing in called nums. So if nums index is greater than nums index plus one. So if the current index we're iterating over is a greater number that the next index, the next elements in that array, we have to swap it, right? Because it's not in order. Uh, so then this condition is true. Therefore, this uh, block of code gets executed. So uh, basically, um, have a temporary variable that houses uh, num, the current index. Um, that current index then, since is, since is larger than the next index, uh, it, it is then assigned the value of that index. So basically nums i plus one, which is the next index, which points to the next elements or number in that array, is going to now equal the 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 uh, temporary variable is going to equal that, and then since we swap numbers inside of the array, swap is true. So since swap is true, we run the loop again until eventually uh, swap equals false down here, and it breaks the do while loop. And we're just printing the, the numbers array, and then we're just returning it here. 
Great. So let's see if that works. Um, we'll just run this file here. Uh, bubble sort. So no bubble sort. Sort.js. And sweet, you can see it down here. Um, basically, it's organized down here. So that's what the, what this simple algorithm does. It organizes uh, things within or numbers within an array that is passed into the algorithm and then it outputs it out organized, right? So here we pass it unorganized um, and then it outputs it. It does its work in here and it outputs it organized as you can see there, basically. Great. So I'm going to keep this video uh, short, and that is uh, bubble sort, right? Right. Simple algorithm um, that sorts things, but it gives you an idea of how algorithms work, right? They're just basically uh, code that is written to do a certain thing, right? Um, there's a lot of clever algorithms out there. I'll, I'll kind of do a couple more in some other videos. But yeah, that's basically it. Uh, I'll leave you guys with a cool computer science quote, kind of like how I do with the finance stuff. Um, humans use text, computers use bytes uh, to communicate. And that's by Ether uh, Nam. Yeah, with that being said, uh, thank you guys for watching. I appreciate your time. And I hope I uh, showed you something cool and maybe you start getting a better understanding of what algorithms are i think it just makes sense to understand them somewhat considering they're all around us all the time and they run everything right so yeah awesome you guys have an awesome week uh and i'll talk to you soon